Today, um, I'm going to talk about some common uh, emotions and thoughts that are very common in our <clears throat> daily lives, right? Maybe a little bit helped you to understand how to control them. <clears throat> so actually there are so many people who mm, believe in different different ways. Uh for example, there are some people who have no beliefs in the, any sort of spiritual practice, spiritual path, but who wants just happiness, right? Happiness of this life. Many people do not believe spiritual practice. <clears throat> Okay, that is there. That, um, but I think if um, if you can keep a like suitable spiritual practice that really benefits uh, your mind and your situation, if you continue to practice. Um, that kind of uh, practice, you know, throughout your life, then um, it's clear. And I believe uh, no matter what circumstances you have to go through, you, know, you can be easily uh, to deal with your situation and circumstance and um, emotions, no matter, you know, they arise. <clears throat> For example, if you don't have any spiritual practice, but automatically you have all of these emotions and uh, negative thoughts, doesn't matter you believe spiritual path, spiritual practice or not, you have this automatically of negative thoughts and emotions. Uh, so they can make you very difficult, um, um, your life very difficult. Therefore, Buddha said that um, every single attitude of the body, speech, and mind, uh, you should analyze, you should uh, investigate, must not mix with your ego. Uh, you must not mix it with your own any other negative emotions, negative thoughts. So that means, uh, you know, um, we need some uh, instructions, teachings, um, methods, how to deal with our um, emotions and how to control them, right? If you don't have any spiritual practice, um, you don't have any uh, instructions, um, then, you know, what should you do with this kind of emotions? <clears throat> so, 
So, uh, when we talk about emotions, there are so many, right? Some emotions are positive and realistic, and uh, we need them, you know, certain times for um, developing our human qualities. Therefore, some emotions are to be cultivated on the path and uh, we need, and uh, other emotions are not. So we need to abandon them, right? Summer we have to cultivate, summer we have to purify, abandon them. <laughs> so therefore, if you don't have any spiritual practice, uh, you don't have um, the instructions, then you don't know how to cultivate these necessary realistic emotions, or you don't know how to abandon or control some negative emotions that you that uh, makes your life very difficult. Therefore, spiritual practice is very necessary. Now, let's talk about um, desire. Last Sunday, we talked about des desire. As long as you follow, follow desire, then no matter, remember? You try to enjoy different ways. It doesn't work, right? Because of strong desire. Do you think are all desires are bad or negative? For example, what about uh, desire to attain enlightenment? What about um, desire to generate love and compassion and bodhicitta? We understand that desire kind of uh, the part of attachment is negative, right? But how about this kind of desires, you know? So generally, uh, Buddhist point of view, there are two different desires. The first, the desire that is that is problematic, um, exaggerate the good qualities of an object or person or you know um, or place or idea, and cleans to it. That kind of desire is again um, a form of attachment, right? Attachment because, uh, um, as you know, only the re result uh, we receive it uh, is um, uh, dissatisfaction. And uh, dissatisfaction is the biggest cause of uh, suffering in samsara, biggest uh, cause uh, suffering of our life, in our life. And on the other hand, the desire that causes us to develop bodhicitta and causes us to attain enlightenment is completely different, different than that. Because here we realize that uh, better states of being possible and develop, uh, develop a realistic aspiration to achieve them. So Buddha said that um, this kind of desire is what he called it, the lineage holder. I don't know exactly 
Don's and by means like uh, I don't know how to say it's kind of like family horror. No, that's not. Uh, I think it's a lineage holder. I mean, it means like Don's and by in Tibetan. It means that um, the son of Buddha who will continue to hold the teachings and the lineage. Right, you say I want to attain enlightenment so that I can do this and that for others, right? So I want, that's kind of um, different desire. I want to generate bodhicitta so that I can do this for others. So that, that is like the son of bodhisattvas who really want to hold the teachings and want to attain enlightenment, so then, so then, after that, you have lots of, your capacity is limitless, so then you can do many things for others, include yourself, right? So the motivation, now you see, is not mixed with your ego, this kind of desire. So there is no misconception are involved, this kind of desire. So this desire is a method of completion, vast benefit others for others and for, for ourselves. So this emotion is realistic, I said, and therefore it is positive, you know. So it is a kind of, it is like a bridge between two parts, the samsara and then, and then liberation. So this kind of desire doesn't harm any beings. And it is a method to transform everything into love, compassion, bodhicitta, and uh, your wisdom. So it is a sort of, you know, it is actually, it is a commitment, attainment, you know. It is a method uh, to improve this life, improve this life, and to attain uh, the enlightenment. If you don't have this kind of desire, then um, impossible. Mm, become a bodhisattva, become a, a, a enlightened being, you know, impossible. So therefore, this kind of emotion is necessary. But the other desire is not necessary. So that. What's the difference between a thought, an idea, and an emotion according to Buddhism? What's the difference between a thought or an, an emotion? Thought and emotion. Thought is bigger than emotion. Thought is bigger than emotion. Yeah. Your mind, Re relative mind, thought. It's relative mind. So you have good thoughts, you have uh, negative thoughts. What is the difference between a good thought and a good emotion, and a negative thought and a negative emotion, according to Buddhism? It's a, it's a, it depends on your motivation, right? Your motivation. Uh, we don't know, uh, but... Come from emotion? Does a thought come before an emotion, or does an emotion come before a thought? It depends. Um, it depends your situation, I think. Yeah. What is the word for emotion in Tibetan? Is it klesha, or is it just trying to understand what you mean by emotion? Emotions, emotions is so easy. Uh, emotions, compassion is emotion, love is emotion, um, 
uh, this kind of desire is emotion. Um, faith is emotion. Uh, devotion is emotion. Um, there are so many emotions. Um, so it's for each of the, the thought of enlightenment or the emotion of enlightenment. Yep. I don't think klesha. Klesha is not. In English, thoughts and emotions are very different. I do think of thought as something that has to do with a mental process that can be neutral in the sense of not motivated by selfishness. Whereas emotions have to do very much with specific personal objects that, and so the, you wouldn't use thought and emotion in the same way, at least according to my understanding. So what I'm trying to understand is you talked about desire could be... So desire is not thought. It's not a thought. I'll take it as an, it's an emotion. So it's always connected to an object. <laughs> Hmm. Interesting. Is there any like thoughts and emotions that are not related to object? Is there any like single I think object and subject, without each other, you can't, you can't have an emotion, you can't have a thought. Ultimate, uh, ultimate mind is different, but as long as we're talking about relative mind, It's, uh, I don't know, without object. Without object, is there any relative mind without object? Is exist relative mind without object? I don't think so. So mind has, I mean mind, when we're talking about relative mind, it's about thoughts, it's about emotions. Everything like that. You can say my emotion is not my relative mind. So therefore, you don't, you can have emotion or thoughts that without object. Without object is not, is not relative mind. I think, I mean, it doesn't exist. That kind of subject, especially Buddhist philosophy point of view, between subject and object, yeah, there are so many ideas. Anyway, so desire, is desire emotions in your, is it thoughts? I think desire is a thought. Desire is emotion. No? Mm -hmm. Desire is not thought? Well, for us, if you use, I use it in a scientific method to analyze a thought problem, for example. Then I, as a scientist, would not bring in my emotions as much as possible. To where no, what I say is what is the difference between thought and desire? That's what I'm talking about. Is that feeling? Desire has more to do with feelings than emotions. But that feeling is related to the object. Yes, but it's usually an idea of something that is almost, um, in English terms, an emotion is something that arises almost spontaneously and powerfully as an energy, whereas a thought is something that we think that we can have some distance to, so that I think that I can think through a problem without allowing my emotions to get involved. And that's what I'm asking in Buddhism, if you have a, an idea like that about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> without, without an attachment to 
itself is knowing but you could have a thought if you were in that state of non-attachment. You could think. That, that's exactly what I'm trying to ask Temple about, exactly that, whether that's... But that's, that's, his point is that even without attachment to self, there's no thought because the thought is the object interacting between it. Right. I think thoughts lead to emotions. They're connected. Very much. Generally. Generally speaking, they're very much. Especially in our life, in daily life, very much. They're related to each other, very much. Yes, that's what I'm, yeah, exactly. So I want, I want to practice. I want to generate bodhicitta. What is that? That's the thought. I want object. I, subject, want object. That's, That's your object. thoughts. So that is not desire. The feeling is the desire. Mm-hmm. In the West, we split the body responses from the head responses. Yep. So feeling has a three different categories, right? What kind of feeling is that? That the yearning is a desire. If you drink it, devotion has that element of desire. No, I said, Buddhist point of view, the, the, when, you, when you have feeling, you have three different feelings. Yes. So this is positive, negative, neutral. I want to attend enlightenment. That is the thought. But as soon as you would visualize, for example, when you practice in Kwangyan, and you actually generate <laughs> the feeling in the heart center to not just think about it, to not just have aspiring bodhicitta, but to actually take action, which would move your body to actually help someone in need, that in Western thought is connected more with emotions and with physical energy that moves us, which is what Amelia is talking about, is that, and what also Bruce was talking about, is we separate the thought versus the actual energy that moves the physical body or moves the physical Actions. body or speech. Mm. I don't think so. I don't think that's Buddhist Buddhist philosophy. The view is not, you know, no, that's not not correct. I don't think so. So yeah, we have to think about all these kind of things. Desire is, you said desire is thought, but it's not not emotion. Right? You are saying that. Are you agree? Yes. You say that. No, it's, it's no he, she said that. No, okay, so you said then desire is emotion but not thought. For example, if I have the thought of enlightenment and I use through analytical meditations. No, no, no. That's not so my question that. you is is desire thought or emotion or both? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's both. But you said it's not, it's thought. No, I'm just saying that, that we are training ourselves and we use intellectual terms to say, I understand why I should generate bodhicitta. No, if I say you, if I say just one single question, like, is it, is, 
is the desire, this kind of, I want, I want, uh, not the part of the attachment, but I want sort of this kind of uh, positive, you know, um, like I want to become a good, you know, good person. So is that kind of, that, that, that is desire, right? Desire, right? No, this is not, I'm not talking about my finger. <laughs> that is just, I mean, this is, that's just true. You've never so if I say desire, I want, I want to attain a le a liberation. According to Buddhism, that is a desire. Yes, I'm, generated through emotion. Yes, so that, is that emotion or thought or both? Oh, oh, oh there we go. Now we're saying, then good. Okay. Uh, yes, that's, I thought, I thought that's both. Um, without, without, <laughs> yes. On a, that's it, desire is done now, then. <laughs> now, how about, how about fear? Same thing, it's, this is emotion, right? It's the emotion, uh, fear is emotion closely related to attachment, according to Buddhism. Mm -hmm. Buddha describes that it is because this is the related to attachment. It is because the more attached we are to someone or to something, the more we fear not having it or being separated from it. That's where this fear comes. For example, if you are attached to and emotionally depend on uh, this person, specific like this person, you fear the relationship will end. Or, for example, if you attach to money, is a good, good example. If you attach to money, you fear about not having enough yet. So and so, so many. So according to Buddhism, this is, uh, this is an emotion related to attachment. And Buddha said, we don't need it. We don't need this kind of emotion. And Buddha and the teachers explains very well. Um, generally, people think that this kind of problem is the money or, or the relationship, right? I have this kind of negative emotion that makes me really difficult, fear. But Buddhist point of view, again, the solution, generally people, you know, okay, I have to give up this. Money or your friends or relationship. Buddhist point of view, the solution is not to abandon your relationship or the money. You can have millions of dollars, no problem. But the solution is let go of the attachment, attachment to the money, to them, to, to your, your friendship, your, friend, your relationship, your money, your property, whatever. You can have so many things, but without attachment. Then you have no fear. Everything, all these are based on ego. Yes, it's me, mine, and I'm worried about myself, so therefore I fear all these things. Everything, that's, that's very, very correct. Ego is the, the root of problems, the root of suffering in samsara. That's ego. So if you can sort of let go your attachment to, the, to these kind of things, 
then you can, then Buddha said, you can enjoy them free from fear. For example, for example, meditating on impermanence to me very help, very very helpful um, to let go of attachment. And as we let go of the attachment, then we can see our fear of not having or not or um, losing these kind of objects of attachment will naturally um, dissipate. Dissipate. And so they are very, see, the fear comes from I an mean, attachment, I think. Attachment we have because of ego. Ego because of ignorance. So, that's why ignorance attachment, right? Attachment is a big thing. It has so many different emotions. And so many different emotions come, come from attachment. So now, when we're talking about attachment, what about like attached to Buddhism? People who really, really like it. Buddhism. And what should we do if someone criticizes our beliefs? If someone thinks that um, you are stupid for believing in this and that, you know? Or if someone uh, disagree with our beliefs. We get angry, right? Because attached to this thing, attached to my religion or my spiritual, you know, path. And somebody is criticized. You are stupid. You believe in this, in this, this thing. And then we just not open our mind, instead we angry. We get angry. I used to, on, from my experience, you know, sometimes people, you know, other religious people talking about, I, I believe this, but you, you can't talk. And then I, I thought, you know, it's stupid. And, and then now I say myself, it's not. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that we are stupid. That doesn't mean you are stupid. You just believe it, right? But it is very important to not be attached to the name and level of our religion. Just the name, you know, Buddhism, you know. The point is, we are looking for, we are skin for the, 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 the truth, the happiness, right? The try to find uh, the nature of uh, ultimate, our life. And happiness, but not sort of promotion of religion. So, I think, you know, uh, we should not think that this kind of specific religion is the best or good for everybody. So, uh, if somebody say that, I automatically, oh, you are so stupid. Mm -hmm. you know what I say when people say that? 
Very much. I think it's very... It's not important. Yeah, we should not say that. You know, we... You can say, this is best for me. It make, makes sense, right? Makes sense. Not for everybody. So, um, but this is very important. If you like, that means like you like uh, keep this spiritual path. That means um, it's working. But you should not really attach to just a name, you know. Means like you have to uh, using use this uh, these teachings and instructions and put it into your life. Then, um, whatever this is attachment or desire, it's it's not the, it's not you know uh, again. Um, negative so therefore you know being open to what others people say is very useful I think rather than get angry so Buddha himself said that remember we should check um, his teachings and not just to believe not just to believe in them you know blindly we always we always say that you know you should check my teachings there are also two things you have to understand if you are very new and uh, and uh, beginner and no experience, no any experience, meditation or Buddhism, then you have chance to receive the teachings and use, in, use your wisdom and investigate. Very important. Buddha said that. Another thing is not always keep that in mind. When you become a, like like you all of many of you like you know become a Buddhist and then you practice and you you practice preliminaries still you are checking is this correct is Buddha is 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 a good teacher that's not correct you have to give up that that once you get there then you don't have to check you don't you have to let go of your hesitations and if this practice helped me or not or this is am I then you don't have to check. You, it's opposite. You have to believe. You have to believe in his teachings. You have to believe in your meditations. Still, you are checking. It's just too late. You know. You once you take the the vow, you take refuge, refuge vow. After that, you I mean you don't have to check. You know. And Buddha, I mean, I always say, if you are not so sure, don't take refuge vow. Then you have chance to check and everything. And then if you don't like, then just leave it, you know, and try to something else, right? But once, you know, still like I have a problem with this. Some people like, you know, still they're, they're already done practice. Okay, this uh, refuge, bodhicitta, almost, already, almost all done. It's, you know, preliminaries and still there check in and they have lots of hesitations that's not good so you know but in, uh, whatever when you start when you're very new new person beginner you don't know about Buddhism you don't know then you have chance to check and make sure that this is good or not that's I think very important to understand um, for example once I have my teachers and still I'm checking, it doesn't make any sense, right? You have your teacher. Before you receive any teachings like, like you know, you asked, right? You asked, I want, a, I want your student. Can you accept me? 
you have that kind of agree, right? You know, uh, teachers say, yes, I can accept you my student, or students say, yes, I want you, you my teach, teacher. And then after that, just let it go. All your hesitations, no matter your teachers, you know, um, go to, um, uh, what do you call it, this, um, um, uh, 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 yeah, and uh, the drink beer or whatever, smoke or whatever, it's fine, right? It's fine. You sh you, you don't have to check and or you, you don't have to be an idea and know that you are doing this, you know. It's too late. <laughs> that's it. Buddha said. That's, that's Buddha said. After you, re after you receive lots of teachings and everything like that, then you have to accept everything. Simple. Yeah? You have talked many times about not eating any kind of meat or fish or anything. How important is that to the Buddhist beliefs? I don't think not only this is not only Buddhist idea. If you really want to develop your compassion and your, your bodhicitta, and if you're thinking about this equal or equal system, right? Like you and me, what is different? You want happiness, I want happiness. What is different, me and animal? So if you think that way, then you can, I think it's very easy to know, nobody wants suffering. So you're saying that if you are a Buddhist, or you're eating Indian fish, or whatever, animal, you can't really develop bodhicitta and compassion because you think of yourself and others. There's a division there. It, it's not an equality. No, I think there are many, I can't say if you eat meat, then you cannot develop your bodhicitta mind. I can't say that. There are so many, some people say it depends your motivation. Some people say it depends your capacity. Uh, it depends where you live. If you live in the Arctic Circle and you would die if you ate meat. Yep. Well, that's different, but I'm speaking generally like in... Generally, yes. Yeah, who has a, who has a mind? Who has a consciousness? Then they have a, uh, again emotions and thoughts and feelings, right? So um, uh, Buddha said, if you are going to follow my direction, and then don't harm others. That is the main thing, right? Um, Train your mind. Don't harm others if you are a follower of mine. So if you, yeah, very important, I think, now we, as uh, we know, when, once we practice bodhicitta, we can see it because bodhicitta really let you think the feelings, right? Others' feelings, your feelings. Bodhicitta really push you, right? That you think. First, they don't say don't eat meat. They don't say that. But if you eat meat, then you have to investigate where it comes from, how, you know, and how you feel, how this, this um, situation, so you will develop, at the same time, you will develop your wisdom. Then you will see the other situation. So it's good. So therefore, you know, Buddha said, some people say, oh, Buddha died because he ate what do you call it? 
uh, he admit, you know, he admit like pork something, and then he died. In Buddhism, we have like thousands of uh, texts and commentaries. I never seen. I don't know where this come from. I think this is come from someone who really want admit. But in, in, in our, in, in Tibetan Buddhism, we don't say that. We do, I mean, we just not sin if, but I don't, I don't, I don't um, see, you know, I don't know any like that kind of information, you know. Oh, Buddha died when he was uh, 81 years old because he ate pork. <laughs> you know, it doesn't make sense, you know. I mean, Buddha knows, actually, they said he has a mission mind. So then, um, but I don't know. It's, it's, today we are just talking, you know, nonsense. Um, but I want to help you kind of, uh, when you have this kind of emotions, how to um, find the solutions and um and control or transform into positive so we have we talked about desire we talked about attachment a fear yeah um so Buddhist teachings are not just something to understand intellectually. It is meant to improve our minds. Intellectual understanding is bad, I think, is really bad. Because then you can see, right, others, you know, you can, oh, that's not, you, you are Buddhist, you are teacher, or you are, you know, you are not supposed to do this, because I know what Buddha said. So if you don't put them into your practice, then you can see very, uh, right away, somebody's doing something wrong, okay, you, you're, you know, you become a really judgmental, you know. Intellectual understanding, Buddhist teachings, not good. I mean, one way, not good. So, understanding is good, but into put to practice, into put your, your, your practice, you know. It is so important uh, to understand uh, the teachings, um, the point is, you know, improve your mind, your mind, your actions. Okay, now what about stress? Another one. Wow. Every day. Right? When you are stressed because you think there is not enough time, then you feel pressured. So it is very, again, it is very helpful to think about your priorities and decide what things are the most important in your life. Then you can choose to do um, those things and put others aside, right? Another is you are stressed because uh, you don't have the ability to do something that is uh, expected of you. But you need to accept your, um, uh, your capacity, your limitation, limitations. You need to sort of communicate uh, with the people who have such sort of expectation of you. Very helpful, I think. 
And another thing is when you are stressed about like uh, sudden change, big, big change in your sort of uh, living situation. Then, of course, you know, right? It's very important to think about impermanence. Always. Impermanence is very, very useful. Then you can accept the change rather than stress it. So there are many solutions for these emotions. These are very common, right? What about self-blame, self-hatred? Not this is not common in Tibet and Tibetans, but I think here I know very common. Self-blame and self-hatred. Generally, it is con uh, it is come from self-blame. It is come from considering that you are responsible for something, but you have no. Uh, power over and there are so many causes that make you unhappy with yourself so many right many people I think in this country many people are struggling with this kind of problems So, you need to clearly examine and understand what you are responsible for. What you have uh, sort of power over and what uh, you are not. And I think don't sort of take others' actions, someone else's actions, that you are not responsible And you have no power to take it. So there is no need to feel guilty or blame yourself for others' responsibilities. So you should accept, you should take care of your actions, Buddhist point of view, your actions, but not others, if you have no power or uh, no good motivation, then don't take someone else's actions and responsibilities. You should accept your actions and take care of your actions. If you can accept your actions, then you can change, right? If there is not something not good, you can change. If you accept, if you accept, you can change. If you angry with yourself, that means you are not accepting. Then you cannot change. So if you accept yourself and practice um, what do you call it? Self-love, right? Self-love, uh, self-kindness. It is solution. It is the solution. Self-blame, self-hatred. I think it's self-love, self-kindness. So this practice makes you really uh, relax first and then allows yourself to uh, move uh, gently towards self-protect, understand yourself, Very bad. If, you know, the self-hatred and to look down upon oneself is, Buddhist point of view, the destroyer to grow your precious human life, destroyer to grow your love. So when you can let go of what other people uh, think, especially on your situation, then uh, 
what do you call it? You get the access, right? To your love, your, your, your kindness, your wisdom. Then you have sort of, uh, what do you call it? The feeling that you are enough just as you are. So you should not believe uh, the meaningless reasons that make your life not grow. So, so many, uh, I, I'm not going to talk all of these emotions, but these are very common, I think, in our daily life. But the big question is now, the big question is, can meditation solve these emotional problems? That's a big question. If you ask to Buddha, he will say, it depends on you. It depends on you. The Buddha himself, for example, we think about, Buddha showed us the method to do that, right? The method that we can see Buddha himself used to go from the state of an ordinary being means the way we are now to the state of total purification, the enlightenment. So we have examples. But that, that question to answer is, it's up to us to practice this method or not. Therefore, spiritual practice is, I think, very necessary in our life. Because then you have all these uh, uh, instructions, methods, you know. And if you have enough to practice, after your practice, you can see, right, you have uh, become sort of happier, and less this uh, these emotions. You can free. I mean, Buddha said that freedom is happiness. Freedom is happiness. Being controlled by others is suffering. So he said that. Being controlled by others means negative emotions, not other people, though. So what is, freedom is the happiness. What is this freedom? This freedom is the genuine happiness of the mind, of the mind. And that kind of happiness can only come from training the mind and your attitude, your actions. So it is important to understand the point, the teaching, meditation, right? Uh, according to Buddhism, they say spiritual meditation practice is the biggest part of your life. It's necessary. So therefore, you have to understand the point, understand the value, understand the precious, understand these opportunities. Very important. Wake up. Time is very fast. Very go fast. Life is very short. Once you understand the, the value of your practice, your meditation, then somebody say, don't practice. You're not going to listen. These kind of things are in your mind.
even though in China, want, they want to destroy your spiritual practice, but they can't. Because in here, right, inside of your body, they can't destroy that. No one. Nobody dis destroy. But you can. You destroy. You can destroy your practice. Right? Somebody can't. You can. So it's so important. If you don't understand the value of the, the precious, the opportunities, then you're going to destroy your spiritual practice. So you have to understand the point. The point is your mental attitude, the attitude of renunciation, right, which is practice contentment, satisfaction. The attitude of bodhicitta, which is practice kind mind, kind mind. And attitude of wisdom, wisdom, very, very important Buddhism. Without wisdom, you cannot develop your practice. So we, wisdom, attitude of wisdom, which is realization of the nature of all, all phenomena. That is wisdom. So the combination of these three points put together, then your practice will be very, very beneficial, very beneficial to all beings, include yourself. The combination of these three, renunciation, very important. Bodhicitta is very important. Wisdom, very important. Three of them, if you have these three, you are very close to attain enlightenment. Renunciation doesn't mean that you're going to give up everything that you own. Not, not Buddhist point of view, it's not that. The renunciation means, just I said, right, give up, abandon, diminish your attachment. Then you can have so many things. So, uh, I think we have to meditate now. I don't think. No, okay, meditation. We talked all of this um, about all of these uh, emotions, feelings. Do not, I think, do not think about like uh, how, what is Buddhist philosophy point of view about this feel, this thoughts, this this emotions. What is the scientist point of view? Of? No, you know in your life, a de daily life, you have to think that, right? Okay, today, if I have this, if I have this thought, what do I do when this thought or this emotion come up? We have to, we have to work on that, right? So whatever your thought come up, especially when you meditate, when you're meditating, you have lots of thoughts. Thinking. There is, there is no need to stop thoughts. Or you can't, actually, you can't. You can't stop your thought. And you don't need, you don't need to stop your thoughts. When you are meditating and you realize that you have been lost, in thought, then what you you need to do is simply return your awareness. 
You can do this. Nobody, can. you can do this, right? Awareness. And sometimes the, the teachers always say, you may, you know, um, you can take your thought as the object of meditation. Or letting thoughts come and go, which means uh, not paying too much atten attention to these thoughts, right? Just uh, let, let them come and go. So, during the meditation, as we know, there are different feelings, uh, different thoughts will arise, right? We know that. And the Tibetan, this teacher's instruction for that, do you remember, is... Do not further anything. That's all. Do not further any, anything. It means that you should not develop any further kind of thoughts. So, rest. Rest in its nature. Rest in its nature, your awareness. So, do not try to. That means do not try to stop your thoughts or do not follow them any further. The key point is that thoughts and destruction are nature, I mean, Buddhist point of view, nature part of meditation. Because uh, as you grow more and more sort of familiar with the uh, meditation, meditative awareness your thoughts this kind of your thoughts will uh, not arise and less and less less and less it's true less and less so meditation today is looking at your mind and then relax on it isn't that easy looking at your mind and then relax If you want, you can enter more deeply into the experience of self-awareness and relax on it. Relax on it. So, meditation, when you meditate, it means just to remain in the present moment and with your whole strength and focus on this self-awareness, self-awareness. Then doesn't matter, then doesn't matter what kind of emotions, what kind of feelings, what kind of thought arise, how many times your mind wander away. It doesn't matter because you know how to liberate them. You know how to recognize them, absorb them, you know. So you immediately recognize your thoughts, then just to relax there, right? If you don't have thoughts, then you just relax. If you have the thoughts, then you recognize, liberate them, and then relax. So, if you can, then it, it's, you know, it can help you learn how to continue meditate, continue open your mind, which means losing, without losing um, self-awareness. Do you understand, right? Self-awareness, do you understand? We, we talked about many, 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 many times self-awareness, 
relax on it. And sometimes difficult, you know, people who are very beginners, no have experienced any meditation, it's difficult. Then I think, I think it's very helpful if you meditate on your, um, what do you call it, these three um, uh, breath, breath stages, right? So breathe in, pause, means relax. Breathe out, pause, it means relax. So three stages practice, very helpful. If you can, then focus on your nature, self-awareness, and relax. That's all, okay? We have five minutes or, um, yeah, five minutes, please. This is not analytical meditation, right? Self-awareness meditation means rest and medita meditation. So, That's it. A few minutes, please.